Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Black History Month and welcome to the A. Watson Armour Three Research Seminar Series, Black and STEM, where our guest speakers and panelists are educators, students, and science professionals who will share their expertise, personal career paths, and discuss the importance of BIPOC representation in the sciences. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Chris Shell with us to begin this year's series. He received his BA from Columbia University and is very familiar with Chicago, receiving his master's and PhD from the University of Chicago and conducting his research at the Lincoln Park Zoo and the Field Museum. He completed his postdoctoral work at Colorado State University and the National Wildlife Research Center became an assistant professor in urban ecology at the University of Washington, Tacoma. And he's now an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. Chris is an award-winning scientist, has published numerous papers in several prestigious journals. And his work integrates principles from the natural sciences with urban studies, environmental justice and climate change to address the ecological and environmentally uh, envir evolutionary, sorry, consequences of systemic racism in urban environments. Dr. Shell will begin this year's series with his talk, Living for the City, Conserving Urban Biodiversity Through Social Equity. You may recall that Stevie Wonder had a song titled Living for the City. Chris will speak to its relevance in scientific terms as he shares about how racial and economic oppression affect urban ecosystems. And why leading with an environmental justice and social equity framework in the natural sciences can promote conservation, sustainability, and resilience. Welcome, Dr. Shell. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate you. I appreciate all the kind words. Thank y'all for having me. Um, I'll say that as a graduate student at University of Chicago, I had seen quite a bit of these talks um, being academically raised in that department. Um, and now just being able to give a talk in this seminar is, is not lost. Um, the significance is, is quite profound. So I appreciate y'all. I appreciate your time. And as Rita had noted, yes, I am a Stevie Wonder fan, right? Was, was really raised in that era of all things, oldies, old town music, R&B, Motown. So a little bit of nod here to Black History as we start off the series in Black History Month. But what I'm going to do is provide you a little bit of a narrative to walk you through how social, ecological, and evolutionary processes are all intertwined in the city and how cities are really good petri dishes, if you will, to understand these mechanisms, to understand the interlinking between each of them and how if we're able to successfully understand them through social, racial, economic equity, then we can better understand how do we start to heal and conserve biodiversity within and outside of our cities. So I'll say that Let's start with a premise, okay? And this premise will help set the framework. It should be noted that the premise I also oftentimes use, as I do in many of my classes, pop culture references to, to make it fun, but also because I was a BA in psychology, I think about cognitive heuristics, how to create links with the stuff you know and the stuff you don't know. So in that way it's strengthened, right? So let's start with this premise. The premise being that social inequality is an ecological issue. And that seeing it as such allows us to understand how injustices within human societies not only shape the social structure of cities, but also the natural structure of those landscapes as well. And it should be noted that for me, this entire process, conversation, exploration, and investigation started in Chicago. So when I was interviewing as a potential graduate student for the University of Chicago, I would meet with say, Matt Nelson, Jill Mateo, Mike Coates, Bruce Patterson, and others that would tell me, hey, you're interested in canids? That's great. Have you heard about this coyote in the quiz? <laughs> so I would later find out that apparently 
in downtown Chicago, right? And one of the Quiznos there, a coyote walked into the front door. Yeah, walked into the front door of the Quiznos and just sauntered over to the drink cooler, hopped into said drink cooler, sat down there, looked around, and then fell asleep. Stayed there for 45 minutes. There were people eating and there were folks making sandwiches. They stopped what they're doing. <laughs> they all get out of the Quiznos and say, yeah, this, this doesn't seem like uh, my expertise. So they call animal care and control who then relocates the animal. But the adaptability of these organisms is what led me to think, well, how, how exactly are coyotes and other wildlife species making it in environments that would seemingly be inhospitable to them? Little did we find out, yeah, and Jeff Goldblum here, a little bit of Jurassic Park flavor for you, but in the first Jurassic Park movie, one of the quintessential iconic lines that he says is life finds a way. Now, granted, this is in response to and in relation to dinosaurs eventually finding their way out of what seem like strong, but ultimately become flimsy man-made structures and just figure out ways of how to reproduce. Never mind the pseudoscience that exists in Jurassic Park. It's a good blockbuster. The point being is that we can take that lesson, if you will from Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park, and indeed co-opted. Life is finding a way, dot, 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 in cities. And not just cities in the United States, y'all. This is cities everywhere, cities globally, from urban smooth coat otters here in the top left in Singapore, to raccoons in the Pacific Northwest here in the middle, and everything in between. Wildlife are developing strategies to cope with, survive, and in some instances, thrive in cities. And for myself, who is an urban and behavioral ecologist that studies carnivores, I can tell you that we've seen a lot of these adaptations firsthand, a lot of the flexibility firsthand. These two videos that you see side by side, for instance, are those from community members very much interested in the same questions we are. What does this adaptation mean for these organisms? How on earth are they doing it? The video on the left that you see was taken by a community member at Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium. This particular video is of raccoons in the middle of the day walking through a parking structure with no care in the world, all right? The video on the right, and again, I do work on cute organisms and charismatic megafauna, so I have to give you puppy videos, right? The video on the right is of about three to four week old puppies that are emerging from their den at night. And notice this, y'all may have noticed the structures here in this video. That right there is for say a water hose. If you may have guessed, is this somebody's house? You would have been correct. Some coyotes will use human structures and under those human structures, dig burrows that then they are able to have their pups in. So in both of these instances, we see how animals that we previously thought would never be able to survive in cities are figuring out ways to take what they got, essentially take the lemons they have and make some lemonade. What's really important about urban ecology and urban ecology studies from the past up to the present is that we oftentimes think of human beings as quintessential to this system. And I oftentimes like to think that humans are the directors and the audience of the adapted screenplay of urbanization. AKA, we are the Lynn manuel Miranda of this joint, right? Not only did we cast all the cast members, we put together all the songs, we sang in some of them, even though we weren't as good as Leslie Odom Jr., we did the best we could, right? We also are acting in this play. We also are seeing it as it unfolds. So urban ecology is one of the disciplines that allows us to really combine social and ecological frameworks to understand what are the mechanisms emerging from that. And then one of the newer layers is how over time do those mechanisms influence social and biological evolution. But some of y'all may be like, man, urban ecology, why, why cities? <laughs> why are we studying cities? Well, there are some solid reasons for that. And I think it'll be important for us to detail a little bit of the history of the field in order for y'all to understand why we do what we do.
should be noted that the prevailing wisdom, maybe even as short of a time window as 30 years ago, was that cities were inhospitable wastelands, that they had too many people, too many disturbances, a lot of pollution, and impervious surfaces that chopped and screwed habitat six ways to Sunday, right? Not many organisms are able to survive in cities. That was the prevailing wisdom. However, many of our social science partners were already studying urban ecosystems to try and understand what are the unique properties of those ecosystems, some of whom came from the Chicago School of Sociology, right? So social scientists there were pioneering ways to take ecological theory across many ecological levels, from organismal ecology all the way up to global ecology to describe city structure and function, even though natural scientists were largely absent from those conversations. And there was this need to describe and understand human population as it changes over time because of the fact that urbanization, it was starting to ramp up, right? And not only was Chicago paying attention, the globe started paying attention. Why? Well, UNESCO started to realize after some data began to emerge, uh-oh, CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere and it seems to be human driven. So a lot of atmospheric research that was done in the 60s started to really raise the hackles of many scientists to think about what are our impacts on the globe, on our region, what are impacts locally? How do we understand them? So UNESCO created the Man and Biosphere Program, which essentially was one of the first to study the interlinking between natural and cultural ecosystems, right? And in the 70s and the 80s, they caught a lot of inertia, and yet that inertia kind of died down a little bit. It wasn't really until the 1990s that the U.S. National Science Foundation, you all know it as NSF, right, funded what are now two long-term ecological research or LTER programs. I was a Baltimore Ecological or Ecosystem Study and the Central Arizona Phoenix or CAP LTER. Now we have a third. So the third being Minneapolis, which just recently got funding last year. So all of this essentially encapsulates the history behind urban ecology. It really started out as more of a social science discipline solely and started to morph as we understood climate change and human impact on said climate change to then really understanding we need to better investigate our cities because more people are moving into cities and cities contribute in a major way to the climate crisis. In essence, global climate change was the alley-oop that urban ecology needed, right? In order to start building more theory, building more practice and application, building more basic science to fully understand the ecosystem processes that occur within our cities. So that led to a revolution in urban ecological theory, where we started to integrate the social and the ecological systems fully, not just social as drivers and that's it, but how do we understand the drivers and how do we alleviate any negative drivers? That would eventually lead to thought leaders like Stuart Pickett and others in the 1990s to build these frameworks to understand how human social systems interact with resource systems. That would then, fast forward 20 years, lead to the development of groundbreaking ecological and evolutionary theory to understand how social drivers in cities influence environmental variation. Everything from, say, temperature, like urban heat islands, or artificial light at night, or even human food subsidies, influencing the individual variation of organisms they're in. Now, certainly it could be influencing plasticity and greater flexibi flexibility, but also influencing gene expression, physiology and behavior that ultimately leads to increasing or decreasing the fitness of certain organisms that are adapted to life in cities. So this is certainly an exciting trajectory to start thinking about how do we investigate classic theories of ecology and evolution within a new framework, within the novelty that is urban ecosystems. And yet, here's the thing, right? Like I said earlier, natural scientists were a little late to this party because 
there were some movements in parallel for those of y'all that are fans or what if you know the watcher is behind because there were movements in the social sciences particularly around environmental justice to understand the interdependencies of people in nature those conversations likely stoked the flames of what urban ecology is now but certainly there were a lot of silos that existed beforehand so let's let's take a look at this other disciplinary universe, right? So the rise of environmental justice scholarship essentially was born out of the civil rights movement when many scholars and activists started to really use data to pinpoint how certain neighborhoods and certain communities were afflicted by pollution, toxic waste, and other environmental ills and disamenities more than wealthier white communities. So in the 70s and the 80s, Dolly Burwell, Reverend Leon White, and Reverend Ben Chavez through the United Church of Christ put together this commission for racial, racial justice to actually address how certain counties and neighborhoods were more prone to, say, having toxic waste sites. As y'all know, most of those communities tend to be predominantly Black neighborhoods. Chavez himself had said that environmental racism is racial discrimination in environmental policymaking, the enforcement of regulations and laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste facilities, the official sanctioning of the life-threatening presence of poisons and pollutants in our communities, and the history of excluding people of color from leadership of the ecology movements, which has lasting impacts. I can tell you that today we still are facing the same number of problems with recruiting and retaining professionals of color within the academy. So it should be noted that a lot of the scholarship and a lot of this activism came to a head in 1982, where in Warren County in North Carolina, there was a protest in a landfill in that county, which was predominantly black, where they were dumping PCBs and other toxic soils. Right, So they would lay their bodies down on the roads to block the trucks from coming to dump the soils again and again and again, constantly polluting the air, the earth, the water. It would then culminate in the 1991 delegates to the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And at this summit in October of 1991, here is where Ben Chavez, Bob Bullard, and others came up with the foundational 17 principles of environmental justice. Now, if this is the first time you've seen the principles, I won't belabor all of them, but I do wanna call some attention to three of them that should be noted in this conversation about how do we combine social, ecological, and evolutionary. Look at number one, affirmation of ecological uni unity and interdependence, free from destruction, right? Number one, developed in 1991, several years before urban ecology started to take off, we're having these conversations about people being a part of nature, not separate from, which previously in the mid 1900s was certainly the case for ecologists. We, wherever we go, we destroy everything. But certainly there are many conversations that are starting to be had now about indigenous thought and how we understand our role in this ecosystem. Number 12, establish urban and rural policies that clean up and rebuild in balance with nature. There you go, in balance with nature, ecological unity, number 16, education of present and future generations in social and environmental issues. So you can kind of see the DNA of urban ecology from the outset actually had many of these themes running through. So let's fast forward now to the present, 2022. We are facing a huge biodiversity crisis, one in which biodiversity locally, regionally, globally is declining, which means we need to dissolve silos quick and fast and in a hurry, right? The silos that used to exist between EJ scholarship and eco-evolutionary research cannot exist anymore. We've run out of time. We should have figured this out yesterday, and we haven't. So that means that nations and the globe need to start wrestling with how do we address these ills? How do we address the past ills and reconcile those ills to understand how we heal our planet? Quite a bit of the answers that are emerging are healing ourselves. So to that point, now here working in California, some of the work we've been doing 
has been with Governor Gavin Newsom and other institutions across the state, as well as other institutions across the globe to build what's called this 30 by 30 initiative. How do we conserve 30% of lands in order to try and conserve 30% of biodiversity? And it should be noted that the conversations aren't just about things like how do you conserve genetic biodiversity? How do you conserve species biodiversity? But also how do we build equity into those programs? And the best way to fully understand this is to take a step back. And I want y'all to think about being a specific Marvel character. Okay, I told you I was gonna use pop culture references, right? So for a second, I want all y'all to be Groot. We are Groot in this narrative, all right? Think about the trees. I want you to follow the trees when I show you in these next slides, side-by-side -side comparisons of two neighborhoods in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Tacoma, that are no more than a half mile apart from each other, okay? So I am group, we are group, y'all are group. Let's get into it. All right, the photo that you see on the left, the aerial photo you see on the left is of a township called University Place, right? It's to the Southwest of downtown Tacoma. The photo on the right is Southeast Tacoma. Now, you can, probably already noticed where I'm going. If you're being group, you're following along on this exercise, you get it. But let me just ask you some rhetorical questions. You think about them in your head. If I were to ask you, all right, y'all, which of these two neighborhoods would you say has a higher tree canopy cover or vegetation cover? You wouldn't flinch. You'd be like, oh, it's, it's university place, Chris. Like, duh, that, that question is easy. I aced this test. I'm like, all right, cool. I then ask you a follow-up question. And I say, of those two neighborhoods, which would you expect to have a higher median household income? If you've grown up anywhere in or near a city, not just in the United States, but globally, you will say, it's still the photo on the left. It's the one of university place, right? That intrinsic knowledge that wealth positively is influenced by and is correlated with species biodiversity, especially vegetation, that has a name. It's called the luxury effect. This idea that species richness, so the number of species in a region, and biodiversity, the relative number of species, their abundance therein, is positively associated with socioeconomic wealth. Now, it should be noted, this isn't always the case, and we'll start to unpack how wealth in and of itself is really just a proxy for a lot of other underlying mechanisms like legacy effects. We'll define that here in a little bit, but it should be noted that if this is the first time that you have heard of the luxury effect, I've done you a solid. Here are all of the papers, empirical papers that have taken a look at how wealth structures communities worldwide across many different trophic levels from primary producers influencing tree species diversity or greater overall vegetation diversity, all the way up to tertiary consumers and everything in between. Now, it should be noted that already in the last two years, there has been a proliferation of studies looking at the luxury effect in their respective cities, as well as looking across cities. And fortunately, through folks like Seth Magley and Mason Fadino, and Liza Lehrer and Travis Gallo up at Lincoln Park Zoo, we were able to work with the Urban Wildlife Information Network to set up these wildlife camera traps to address that very question. How does wealth influence mammalian biodiversity, not just in one city, but across cities? And the reason that part is groundbreaking is because oftentimes, y'all see in the scientific literature, right? You see one study, they study one system, they make an observation in their discussions, they have some particular conclusions to make, and there, that's it. But what we know in urban ecology is that even though urban ecosystems share similar properties with each other, they also are very heterogeneous. Y'all notice Chicago is not Los Angeles. I love both of them. I was born and raised in LA. I met my wife in Chicago. They both have special places in my heart. And I can tell you straight up, they're not the same. And likely the way in which wildlife responds to those cities is also not the same. So we kind of, the metaphor is spit and bubble gum, but with 
wildlife camera traps are able to start cataloging and asking the question, how does wealth and urbanization, so the way in which the city is built, affect wildlife across cities? So in this study, led by Dr. Magley and Dr. Fadino, we were able to observe urban to rural camera gradients and transects across 20 US cities from 2013 to 2019. Here you see a couple of those cities, Seattle, Chicago, and Wilmington, Delaware, with each of the yellow dots representing where a camera would be. And we were able to approximate the human footprint, which we call here our urbanization metric, using the proportional impervious surface cover. So think concrete, think asphalt, right? How much is within a kilometer to two kilometer buffer, building densities and vegetation cover. We then approximated the income gradients within a region using the cost of a one bedroom apartment. And this was the most inclusive way that we can include neighborhoods that have multifamily homes or housing. And then finally, we used a Bayesian occupancy model to determine if urbanization or income or both influence wildlife dynamics. So certainly after we get the cameras from the field, right, we collect them and we get a ton of interesting wildlife photos. All of these photos specifically were from the Tacoma site. So here you see a black-tailed deer up in the left a coyote that is investigating the lure that we put on the tree in order to get the animal into the cone of detection. My personal favorite of all the photos is the one in the top right. And you may see a couple of raccoons here on this tree practicing their parkour, right? So we take all of these photos, we collate them together. We say, we detected this animal here at this location for this day. How many times did we detect the animal? How many animals did we detect over time? We can throw all of that together to say, how many species are we counting relative to all of the other sites within a city and all of the other cities? So what did we find? Well, species richness in relation to income gradients, this is kind of a dumb moment, varies across cities. <laughs> but you probably predicted and expected, right? So here is a figure of some of those data from this paper that was just published recently in Global Change Biology. And you'll note here, just to orient you to this figure, the x-axis is a correlation between species richness, so the number of species we're able to count in a city, and a city's income gradient. So if, for instance, this normal distribution curve is to the right of that dashed line, then that means, yes, indeed, there is a positive relationship like we would expect. Those are the cities from St. Louis to Rochester, also including Tacoma, Chicago, and Madison, right? All of those cities tend to have that positive relationship, but it's not all of the cities we surveyed. Certainly, something can be said about a neutral relationship, meaning there is no real relationship that we've seen in the number of species we're able to count in income gradients within the city. So say, for instance, Wilmington, Delaware, Atlanta, Georgia, all the way down to Austin, Texas, and Fort Collins, Colorado. In some instances, the trend goes the other way. We start to see that hmm, the number of species we're counting in total is negatively associated. So again, this is a dumb moment. Not all cities are created, established, developed in the same way. And income, in and of itself, is an incomplete proxy which means we need to start digging a little deeper. A recent meta-analysis done by Curious et al. in landscape and urban planning took a look, at least to date, of all of the empirical studies that tried to observe the luxury effect in their respective cities. And what they did in this meta-analysis is they took the studies for flora, so plants, and fauna, animals, split them apart, and then bifurcated them again between land use consideration and density, with residential land use being, you know, suburbs, non-residential being something more like the combination of industry and shops, grocery stores, and the like. They also looked at density of the city. So whether or not the city was pretty densely packed in, think Manhattan, or sort of sparse, think Los Angeles. And what you'll notice is that, yeah, for plants, in residential areas, there tends to be this positive relationship. We see this positive relationship where socioeconomic wealth predicts 
greater species diversity and richness, but it's not always the case in mixed and non-residential areas. Same thing with dense or sparse cities. This then brings us to the synthesis, right? That as great as our tools are for understanding biodiversity and as great as the social science tools are for understanding human populations and how they relate to each other and to their environment, there still needs to be the breaking of these silos. So then that led to building theory to understand how do these multiple layers exist within a city knowing not only our current time, not only what may happen in the future, but also the past. So a recent review that we did took a look at how structural racism and classism and the systemic biases that influence those processes greatly influence all of the landscape heterogeneities that are important in shaping the ecological and evolutionary processes of cities. So for instance, impervious surfaces get quite a bit hotter than say urban soils that have a lot of green space, a lot of tree canopy cover that serve as environmental cooling agents, right? You get an ecosystem service relatively free of charge by having trees and vegetation in and around you. And yet many low income communities or communities of color due to many systemic injustices in the past and in the present don't have access to that green space. So those areas get a lot hotter because they retain more heat. They also have, again, less tree canopy cover, which oftentimes will lead to greater environmental pollutants in industry in those areas that unequally distribute resources and influence disease dynamics, which we're seeing firsthand work on the world stage due to COVID. The whole reason we're doing this virtually, right? That influences the ecological and evolutionary processes and patterns therein. So it should be noted that one of the ideologies, principles that have been studied the most is how do we understand how social inequality shapes the biology of our cities. And many investigations have involved redlining. So redlining was this US sanctioned process that was put together by the Home Owners Loan Corporation or HOLC from the 1930s to the 1960s. And essentially what they did for more than 200 US cities was create color coded maps based off of where they thought white people should live and black people and other communities of color should live. So these maps from green to red essentially designated A to D regions where A and B, green and blue respectively, like you see here for this redlining map in Oakland, were reserved for wealthy white Americans. Whereas the yellow and the red C and D respectively, were reserved for low income communities and communities of color. Should be noted, even if you had the economic mobility as a person of color to be able to afford homes in those green and blue areas, there were also de facto laws that prevented you from doing so. Everything from say the police being called on you when you were trying to view a home, real estate agents, staring you down or tailing you to then let the authorities know that you were in that neighborhood. In certain instances, bank loans were denied to candidates that again had the economic mobility. Even if you were able to get into those neighborhoods, you would likely have a cross burned on your front lawn. And in some instances, in some cities, and in instances like Oregon, in some states, they were sundown towns or sundown states, which essentially meant if you were a person of color, particularly if you were black and you were caught in a neighborhood that you weren't supposed to be in, you would be apprehended and lynched on site, right? So both the de jour, the official and the de facto unofficial laws put on the books essentially segregated who could live where. Not only did it do that, it also had huge environmental and health impacts. And I oftentimes like to call this for my students, the Avatar Last Airbender part of the series, because we sort of get into how earth and water 
and fire, aka heat, right? Figurative fire and air are all impacted by these legacies. So earlier I referred to legacy effects, right? Legacy effects is what's happened in the past now comes to bear fruit. And unfortunately, redlining has led to many of these detrimental human environmental health impacts, including greater air pollution in previously redlined areas, more intensified urban heat islands. It's hotter in areas that were redlined and were also yellow. There are more frequent ER visits, rates of asthma, and cancer for, for, for residents that live in neighborhoods that were previously yellow or red. St to this day, these are all current data. And urban tree canopy cover and landscape slash habitat characteristics are also altered fundamentally. So for instance, Dexter Lock and Company, as well as Travis Gallo and Seth, and Mason and myself are working on looking at how the ecological properties of cities are fundamentally shaped by redlining. Should be noted, y'all, redlining was abolished in 1968. That was more than 50 years ago. We're still seeing ecological impacts of those social programs. So finally, overall disparities in ecosystem services for communities of color in previously redlined neighborhoods when you coalesce them together, you start to see that the disturbances are not equally distributed across the city. And just to give you all a little bit of flavor what these maps look like, like I told you, there are more than 200 maps, okay? I was only able to fit 61 to 108 because there are that many. If this is the first time y'all have heard of redlining and you're like, how was my city redlined? I provide here the resource for you from the University of Richmond's Mapping Inequality Project, which they have a lot of resources on redlining, urban renewal, several other systems of oppression. I just wanna pull out for you the cities that we do our work in in the Shell Lab, from Tacoma to Seattle and San Francisco to Oakland, right? Look at each of those cities and you'll see that there is extraordinary heterogeneity in each of the cities. And also, let's go back to the coyote example. If I'm a coyote looking for habitat where I have refuge away from people that won't persecute me. I am able to have enough food. I can raise my offspring and not be, say, potentially predated upon by other organisms. Most of those resources are going to be in those green and blue areas. Now, yes, cities have fundamentally changed since then due to urban renewal, gentrification, and displacement. And yet we still, again, see those signatures on the natural characteristics of the city. So for us in the lab, we use this thought experiment quite a bit and are currently in the process of collecting data to address those questions. How is species richness impacted by and influenced by redlining? So we can just say, throw coyotes on a map, right? And say each coyote is its own breeding pair where you have a breeding pair in and around Golden Gate Park to the west in the center of the San Francisco Peninsula and over here towards the downtown region. And you see shifts from green to red. We can start to build predictions about how prey resources and plant biota are gonna be more limited in red and yellow areas, just simply by the fact that there's greater impervious surface cover, which means that there are less trees. And when there are less trees, there's less cover for prey species. Prey got to hide too. They don't want to get eaten. So that means what's, what's really there to support coyotes? Maybe a lot more human food subsidies, which ironically, this is the daily PSA y'all need to have, don't feed wildlife. Because we know that anthropogenic foods contribute to habituation and tolerance of wildlife toward people. That then leads to them getting into some risky business. We also can say that, all right, well, in those areas where there are greater numbers of disturbances, greater human densities, less vegetation cover, there may be a lot more disturbances that lead to sublethal or lethal removal of those organisms, right? Mortality increases, survival decreases because of the fact they don't have everything they need. So genetic bottlenecks and limited gene flow may be more pronounced in those regions, meaning that you see more genes being lost in red and yellow areas relative to blue and green areas. 
So turnover is greater because you see more individuals die out. That allows us to understand physiological costs to living in certain areas of the city relative to others. Understand how boldness emerges from these organisms. Understand whether or not turnover is in fact occurring. What, what is the survival probability for organisms that live in red and yellow versus blue and green areas? And then lastly, it helps us understand and pinpoint areas of conflict because one of the major contributors to biodiversity loss, yes, is the climate crisis and also us being able to coexist with nature. Does that sound familiar? If it doesn't, it should. Because it's one of the principles of environmental justice, right? The balance and interdependence between us and nature. So for those of y'all that, for instance, are wildlife managers, you know the conflict and coexistence like playbook, like a quarterback reading your arm, right? You know that this is an important conversation to have because of the fact that we need to learn how to coexist with species. So we reduce biodiversity. So we save ourselves. So we save ourselves. Right? Selfishly, we want to be able to stay on this planet. This is the one we got. So all of these issues are intimately tied to social equity in the past and in the present. All right. So hopefully now <laughs> through some pop and circumstance and a little bit of pop culture references, I've convinced you that social inequality is an ecological issue, right? By that same token, then environmental justice and anti-racism are perhaps the most potent forms of urban conservation and sustainability that we have. And not, not just in cities, but globally, right? Centering environmental justice and anti-racism narratives allows us to deconstruct systems of oppression, reconcile past ills, and mobilize community members to relinquish the power that we have to put them in positions of power to make the decisions that need to be made. Now, I am humbled to be able to give this seminar and this talk for a great audience. I appreciate y'all, but I should note that I am not the first person to talk about this, nor will I be the last. Access to a healthy environment, that narrative started in the civil rights era and even before then. Many, many, many of our ancestors have been for decades talking about the importance of a healthy environment allowing for people to thrive. And those conversations have progressed and at the same time, haven't changed. So as natural and social scientists alike coming together to figure out what are the best conservation solutions is important. And doing so in cities is especially important because we can serve as the rubric for everybody else. If we can understand how to address social and ecological changes within cities, these human dominated environments, which will continue to grow with most people living in those cities, then and only then can we do conservation justice. And that then oftentimes means changing the narrative. Conservation success is not only the number of individuals that are able to successfully reproduce, have offspring, survive multiple generations, but it also means how do we change the landscape that helps us to continue that narrative, right? So how do we create affordable housing that allows for ecological stability, which in cities can be hard to come by, right? Development is all over the place, all of the time. And that has been made quite apparent in the pandemic where previous neighborhoods that were normally housing for low-income residents, communities of color, are now being extremely gentrified. Creating systems that have greater stability allows for less ecological disturbances, right? Allowing for accessible healthcare, also important. The One Health Framework, for instance, talks about the inextricably linked health of human systems and environmental systems, especially for zoonoses, which, again, COVID is a zoonotic disease. Everything all the way down to strengthening voting rights, allowing for the voices of the voiceless to contribute to this conversation. Now, should be noted, I was academically raised as an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a social scientist, but many of y'all probably are thinking the same thing of like, yo, cities are cool, but there is no way I'm gonna be doing any work in cities anytime soon 
I'm in the academy, or I work at a cultural institution, or I work for an NGO. How, how do I contribute? Well, certainly change from within is just as important as external changes, which means that structural changes in the short and the long term are just as integral. We all have a part to play in this narrative. And in a recent paper that we put together, right after the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, we make a call to abolish anti-Black racism in ecology and evolution, writ large, with recommendations on how to do that, right? Well, acquiring Black history courses be taught through a justice lens, making sure that all graduate programs know about racial injustices and address them head on. Make justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion sessions at conferences, for instance, main events at the conference, not side events, right? Deconstructing systems that potentially can put in bias, as well as amplify Black excellence in ecology and evolution. Hire more Black faculty, right? Position those Black scholars as keynote speakers. Thank y'all feel me. <laughs> Panelists and symposia, fun Black-led grants that oftentimes have substantial community components. And yet, as we know from recent data in NIH, that lead Black organizers for NIH grants are less likely to get those grants because they have more of a community focus. Flip that narrative. And it should be noted that again, y'all are wading into and being introduced to, and hopefully you know some of these folks, a cadre of people, black scientists doing the thing, right? I wish, honestly, I could give a whole lecture on all of the amazing work that black ecologists and evolutionary biologists are doing, because there's a lot of it. And amplifying that work will allow us to build innovative solutions to address the climate crisis, and the biodiversity crisis head on. And cities, cities, ironically, the potential ecosystem that contributed the most to the climate crisis can also be the solution. Ironically, I went through this entire journey through the eyes of the animals that I studied. This video that y'all are seeing is one that I took at one of the captive field sites I did my dissertation research on. So this was in 20, 2013, right? And this puppy that you're seeing here is no more than about 10 feet away from me. Coyotes don't normally get that close to you for reference, right? We gave him the nickname Kal-El because for those of you that are DC fans, a little DC drop, Kal-El is the birth name of Clark Kent, AKA Superman, because dude was fierce. He was super fierce. He's just sniffing around, not really caring what's happening. Mind you, he's only about seven weeks old in his video. He could care less that I'm there. And yet you pan to the rest of the family and the rest of the family is like quite a bit away away from me and saying, you know what, Cal, you got this, man. We're gonna hang back here while you do your thing. We don't really trust this dude, but if you do, that's okay. So for me, starting out as a behavioral ecologist, I, I'm thinking, how do animals behave? And specifically, how do they behave towards people? right? What, if we challenge them, what do they do in kind? That led me to think, well, what are the mechanisms that are governing those behaviors? Thinking about both the epigenetic and the genetic mechanisms that influence those behaviors. And they make you think, well, when they're responding to people, they're doing it in a context that is potentially very different than it would be in natural ecosystems, right? So what happens in cities where these animals are having to experience on a daily basis large amounts of humans, right? How are they then responding to that population? Which then leads you to think, well, not all people respond to the coyotes in the same way. There's certainly heterogeneity. And we know that from talking to community members, certain people act to coyotes differently than others do. Some hate them, run away. Some don't, right? So that difference in attitudes and perceptions also is shaped by your experiences to nature, which is fundamentally shaped by things that happened way before you were even born, which means that you got, you got to start unpacking all of the many layers of what influences the city, which leads you to think about the legacies. What legacies were left by the folks before us 
that we now need to figure out quick, fast, and in a hurry because we've run out of time. So I implore all of y'all on this call to think like, man, all right, there certainly is a synthesis. And I only shared a little bit, but there is so much more. A world that is emerging in urban ecology that hopefully will lead to us better understanding building resilience in our cities, in our people, in our communities. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge a bunch of people. I won't name them all because there are so many of them, but really want to thank you all again for your time. And we'll open up for any questions you may have. Drop here for my email and Twitter handle if you would like to follow me. Rita, would it be helpful to read the questions from the Q&A first or from the chat first? There I am. <laughs> ah, yes. Let me see what questions we should start with. Um, so let's take this one. I know you went over the environmental health effects of redlining, and I was wondering, is there anything being done legally or among residents to advocate more health resources due to the former redlining rules? Yeah, so there are. Most of the programs, if you will, are community-led not necessarily enshrined in policy, although I will say, for instance, that both the governor here of California, as well as the president, have put environmental justice on their docket, right? So many of these ills are known. The patterns are known quite a bit. Actually figuring out those patterns in a system of capitalism, which was built on a system of oppression, that's a little bit harder, not impossible, we know the answers to doing it, but actually having the political will to do it, that piece is important. So grassroots organizations for sure are fighting for, say for instance, zoning laws to be changed here in the Bay Area to allow for more affordable multifamily housing units. There's also been changes to tenants rights that allow for people to stay in their environments. And as we know, California, unfortunately, is one of the states that has the highest unhoused populations. That's in large part due to the way in which economic policies have accelerated that inequality within the city. So any of y'all that have ever been to California know it's super expensive. We live in the most expensive area in the entire country. And figuring that out allows us to also figure out some of the health ills as well. But this is a multifaceted problem. We have to figure out the medical system and the racism that exists there. We have to figure out, even when you have access to green space, are people able to stay in their homes? Because many of the folks that, for instance, didn't have access to green space are then displaced out of those homes because they may not own the homes. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I'll say that there hasn't been substantial enough policy on the countrywide level or the regional level to make a dent in that. Okay, here's another question. Have you looked at a generational change also in some response to biodiversity? We have seen a drop off in the younger generation, 40 and under, neighborhood, garden, stewardship, et cetera. We have people in their 70s that are no longer physically able to care for these things, and we cannot get younger people to help. This is a middle-class area. Yeah, I will note that the organization of the younger generation is happening, but it's relatively sparse, at least within the academy. Should be noted that there are a lot of young environmentalists that are making substantial headway in environmental and climate equity. But it should be noted that being able to be an environmentalist often sometimes is classist in and of itself because folks that are older may have more resources to be able to be an environmentalist. It's quite a bit harder to do that when you have $100,000 in student loan debt and you have to try and figure out a way to survive capitalism, right? Surviving capitalism is antithetical to surviving the environment because of the fact that Maslow's hierarchy would tell us 
that we need to be able to eat. We got to eat. We got to breathe. We got to get from point A to point B before we can do anything else. So oftentimes what I would recommend when I do say community events with folks around coyotes is allow them to see that they have a lot of power, maybe not a ton of power. They may not be the president of the United States, but they certainly have more power and privilege to change the landscape. One very simple example, right? People that own homes can change their backyards and front yards more to foster biodiversity than those that are in apartments. That simple fact means that that individual family in that single family home may serve as a habitat patch for native or non-native organisms to move in and across the city. That simple fact alone means that you can be a biodiversity expert and it doesn't take much. Just plant a couple of native plants, right? Okay. Well, we're nearing our uh, time here. So I'm gonna try to combine these two questions and let everyone know that if we can't answer all the questions here now, we'll get these to Dr. Uh, Shell and he'll be able to hopefully get back to us and we for can sure. share the answers. So um, for those of us working in urban conservation spaces, it, they were advice for language to use, lenses, frameworks, jargon, beyond jargon rather, that resonate with BIPOC community residents, partners, to build common ground and collaboration at these echo justice intersections. How to advance this rigorous science that you model while drawing in other voices? And there's a specific um, related question. What are your thoughts about cities like Detroit where residents push back against free tree planting? Yeah, so I'll say in that question is the answer, everybody has a role to play, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be one that is steeped in academic science. Um, valuing multiple forms of knowledge is superbly important. And that means uplifting community organizations and activists in the same vein that we do, say professors or CEOs, right? And to the example about Detroit, that pushback is good, right? Sometimes the answer isn't always planting trees. And listening to community members is just as important as taking a look at the science. Why? Because those community members are smart. They know what's up. They know if you plant trees, that is going to increase property values and they're going to be displaced. Or in some instances, when you plant trees, it does bring in certain pest species. And we know that just bringing in the trees alone is not sufficient. One, for the housing issue, but two, because pest management services are unequally distributed across the city. And we know that because of research done by Lincoln Park Zoo on rat infestations and reports being made. So collaborators like Maureen Murray and Mason Fedino took a look at how many reports are being made about rats and who is getting those services. So, you know, if you bring in, say, more vegetation, but you don't have a plan for what's happening on the other side, you haven't done your job. You haven't done your due diligence. We, we certainly know that like community members are saying, this is gonna happen, then it happens. And then folks are like, huh, that's really interesting. Why did that happen? Community knowledge is just as important. Thank you, Dr. Shell. We're gonna just end here by saying that we appreciate your insights and helping us become more aware and appreciate how we can be better uh, at coexisting as urban citizens with nature and wildlife and highlighting the many other BIPOC scientists making progress in your field. So I hope everyone enjoyed this Black and STEM presentation and that you'll join us again on February 16th and February 21st at 12 noon, where we'll feature more uh, BIPOC scientists on panels uh, this is going to be geared especially toward our high school students to help them see uh, scientists that look like them and hear about their successes and their journeys so they can start thinking about their next steps beyond high school if they want to become our future and um, conservationists and scientists. And we want you to continue enjoying all of the uh, Black History My programs. Uh, find out more about us at our link. Um, uh, um, Black History Month at fieldmuseum.org. And after the valuable information that Dr. Shell has shared with us, it's equally important 
for us to acknowledge the land upon which we and our institution reside. So thank you again for joining us. Have a good day. Appreciate you all. Thank you very much.